Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are all joining in from. We are very, very excited to talk to you today, today about introduction to microservices. First of all, happy new year. And uh, hi, Vivek, how are you doing today? Yeah, so happy new year, Nish. And uh, whoever has joined in, happy new year to you too. And whoever is going to watch this, I know later on, happy new year. Right. Uh, I work on the uh, .NET community team, and I specifically uh, focus on architectural reference guides, which includes microservices, cloud native apps, modernizing your application from, let's say, .NET Framework to .NET Core, or even you know taking a monolithic applications to uh, the cloud on Azure. So there are a lot of amazing guidances out there on .NET slash architecture. So don't forget to check that out. That's what I do uh, at Microsoft. So Vivek, just introduce yourself. What do you do? Hey, um, I'm a senior cloud advocate, uh, and I'm part of the uh, cloud and AI engineering team. I'm a technophile. I love, you know, I love enjoying um, the learning new technologies, and I'm passionate about DevOps. And uh, basically, you know, I also enjoy traveling. So that's about me. And uh, hey, Nish, uh, I don't you introduce the moderator. Fantastic. Yes, I was about to do that. So uh, so say hi to our good, amazing uh, moderator today, who is Swaminathan Vetri. Uh, he is a cloud solution architect at Maersk and also a Microsoft MVP. So uh, have your questions ready, uh, pop it into the chat, and Swami will be answering most of it, and he'll also bring it us, uh, uh, and we will be able to take up some questions as well. So Vivek, what are we going to learn today? So we have uh, two learn modules, and uh, just in case if you don't know about learn live, it's about um, understand how learning new technologies, new concepts with Microsoft Learn. And uh, today we are going to cover two learn modules. And the first part of the session, we will focus on uh, one of the learn module, which is uh, based on uh, how do you build microservices. And what is microservices, in fact, and also how do you build a microservice uh, app with .NET? And the second part of the session, and which is the second learn module, is basically focused on uh, building the uh, building and deploying the microservice app uh, to Kubernetes. So uh, these are two links. Uh, which is out there, you know, you can go back and uh, uh, work with us as well. If you have the slightest of the setup with you, you can take these uh, links and, uh, you know, build with us. Else, you can sit back, enjoy the session, and uh, and then we can, um, you know, then you can take take these uh, modules later stage and then build on, on, build on top of that. Right, and also I wanted to bring this to your attention that this is gonna be the first in the series of microservices. We have eight sessions lined up for you, so don't forget to tune in every Tuesday uh, to check up on the microservices topics. Some of the topics will go slightly more in depth into cloud native technologies like resiliencies and service meshes and things like that. But this one today, we will focus uh, very much on the cloud native uh, uh, tools like Dockers and Kubernetes and things like that. All right, let me just emphasize on what are we going to learn today. Um, the important things to learn today is we will generally look at what microservices are, like what's this bus all about and why is it important to us right now. Uh, and we'll also look at the uh, technologies involved in it, that is uh, cloud native related ones like Docker, Kubernetes and things like that, and also build a microservice endpoint in .NET. So that's when you start with creating a REST endpoint, how do you containerize it and uh, and, and then in the later, the module two, uh, we'll focus on Kubernetes as uh, Vivek mentioned. All right. So um, yeah, this is a live and interactive session. So you can see us all doing everything hands-on here. So any mistakes that we make here, you will see us how we will recover and make it better. Uh, so feel free uh, to ask questions, uh, join with us and uh, uh, and yeah, Vivek, anything else you want to add on this? Yeah, I mean, uh, we all, we, I mean, we are live and uh, please you know, ask questions, keep going. And we have a wonderful moderator who is uh, taking care of uh, the questions as well. And we will also answer the questions while uh, we are running through this session. And obviously because of the time, uh, we might not pick all the questions here live, but we have a subject matter expert uh, who is at the back end who is answering all the questions for you. 
Right, so let's get started with building the uh, first microservice with uh, .NET. Uh, so let's start with what are microservices? You know, so microservices are the microservices architecture um, is nothing but an architectural pattern which states that your application is uh, composed of multiple smaller services that focuses on a specific business functionality managed by smaller teams. And that is a key thing. It's not about taking your project and breaking that down into smaller web API or REST projects. It's not that. It's about identifying a business domain, creating a business boundary, and then creating building services from there on. So people use domain-driven design often for identifying these business problems and understanding the business boundary and defining it that way. Um, so for today, we will not be looking in depth of that but we will all just look at how do we start with uh, you know, creating an endpoint for microservices and, and go on from there on, right? So <clears throat> to speak further, a few characteristics, uh, characteristics that make up a microservices architecture, and we'll look into that. One of the important thing is microservices are small, and they're independent and loosely coupled. Now, there's often questions that come up, like how small should a microservice be? Uh, the important aspect is that you know you, when you break down a larger application, the smaller part is the business area that you focus on. So it's it's very subjective when we say you know small services and things like that. So it needs to be manageable by a small team. That means uh, they need to be loosely coupled from other uh, services, and that is a uh, is a key. Uh, important thing when it comes to microservices architecture. So Vivek, so what how, what else can we do with microservice architecture? Yeah, so uh, so let us take an example, Nish. You know, you know uh, and even in our learn module, we have example which is about uh, pizza shop, right? If you have a pizza shop as a application, just think that. Uh, this pizza shop is a monolithic application now, and you have a database, and you have, you know, bunch of services uh, within the pizza shop. You know, pizza shop can handle a catalog. That means, you know, set of pizzas, you know, different pizza categories, and uh, there is inventory of this pizza, and there is order, and there is order management system. There could be a payment system, and there is a review system of these pizzas. And if you build this as a whole, right, and take this as a in a big project, right, big application, and if it is monolithic, it has only one database at the bottom, and and at the top you have the application. Uh, just imagine you, you know, building, making change to just the catalog service and just making changes into the catalog service, what happens to uh, the whole application when you go and deploy the whole application? So that's where, uh, you know, microservice uh, architecture comes into help for you, right? Where you can break this into smaller services, where catalog service as a one service, inventory uh, service as one of the service, order management system or order tracking system as one of the service, where you have different set of services and each of these services have its own code base right and it has its mm -hmm. own uh, you know code and uh, maybe uh, we are going to discuss later uh, about different programming language as well but uh, different code bases it is managed independently and as you told it is loosely coupled that means the changes you make to catalog service uh, does not affect the changes, which is uh, you know, which does not affect already running inventory, inventory service, or uh, even if you make changes together, uh, it does not affect each other as well. So that's the um, that's one of the uh, characteristics of the uh, microservice. The other part is deployment. So Nish, uh, you know, throw some light on the deployment side. Yeah, absolutely. Once you separate the code bases and you have its own CI CD pipeline, then that means you're just making it clear that you know you can uh, you can deploy it independently, right? Uh, once you're loosely coupled, that means uh, you don't have any dependency on another service to complete its feature or something like that. You can always uh, have your own CI CD pipeline and deploy them uh, into production. Uh, very easily, and and talking about shared, co you know, separate code bases. One thing to remember is, you know, there are these are all patterns, but there are situations where you might want to, uh, you know, change things. That's also totally okay. I have known people who use Monorepo as well, but their CI/CD pipelines are are separate. Uh, you know, they do Monorepo for just simplicity, but the CI/CD pipelines are separate, and that is also uh, important thing to know that you know you should have that cadence of uh, a 
quickly able to release a feature to production or fix a bug to production without really worrying about whether the other microservice uh, needs to complete its task or not, right? So, <clears throat> and then, uh, so what, what about data, Vivek? What, what, how, do, how do we handle data in, the, in that case? Yeah, so uh, as I told you, right, um, if you had a monolithic application, you would have shared database. And if something happens to database when you're upgrading or something, your whole application is down. And now that means uh, you you cannot order if you make a change to a, something related to review, da review data changes, review service data changes. If you make those changes and the whole application goes down in a monolithic uh, world, and if you are in the microservice world, right, if each of these services are having its own persistent data store, it's, it saves its state of the data and uh, it is separated and these uh, this data is exchanged between different you know different services via the APIs, not directly talking to any data databases. Uh, so each service having its own data and uh, it is maintaining its own state and making changes to its own uh, data store and it is independent uh, and and maybe you can also use different uh, databases for different services and in various uh, cases right so that's one of the thing and and uh, and coming talking about communication of these services Nish uh, how how does it work you know how do communication work exactly so now that you have a separate databases and no two services can access each other's database. Uh, data is directly uh, pointing to a database. So they have to actually work with uh, a well-defined APIs. And um, so that means you define a contract. How does how does uh, one microservice get the data of the other? That is always through a, a contract. You know, there's an endpoint. Either you connect them, uh, connect with a synchronous endpoint that is like making a HTTP request or a gRPC request, uh, and then just getting those data that way. Or you can have a completely asynchronous form of communication. Like for example, you are completing an order and the order system can raise an event saying, uh, you know, now the payment has to be initiated and there should there can be a payment service that's listening to this event and then it pulls up the payment uh, payment um, related event and then processes that and then it raises another event for the, another microservice to count. So that's how uh, they have to be independently working uh, by uh, using well-defined APIs. Um, and also, um, that's a key thing. Like you know, so no two service knows how uh, a particular implementation has happened uh, in the other microservice. So that brings up a point that you know you can have a completely different architecture or uh, even a different programming model, right, Vivek? Yes, um, you know, while while I was discussing with you as well, it's fun, by the way. But I'll come to the fun part later. The first part is obviously um, you you can have these different services in different uh, programming languages, maybe libraries and frameworks. Uh, even the databases can be different, as I told you, right? Even the databases for these uh, different services can be different. You know, you, you could use uh, SQL Server for catalog, and for auto tracking, you could use MongoDB and Cosmos DB and other things. So, uh, this is the advantage of uh, of the uh, using the microservice architecture pattern, where uh, you have the flexibility of using different programming languages. For different set of services, and and uh, as as a use case, you know why this is really helpful is because when you're migrating from monolithic to uh, microservice architecture, and uh, if you have a legacy project and you know, leg a legacy uh, you know applications, probably you might have uh, built your application in PHP, and uh, you have new set of uh, customer scenarios coming up and new set of customer scenarios you are designing in .NET and um, the services which are there in PHP you still you know maintain it in, in PHP and probably slowly migrate it to uh, .NET and you know, other required languages if you are looking at different scenarios. So NetNet, um, -net, uh, you could use uh, different programming languages for different uh, applications, or you could use the same programming languages. The fun part here is, you know, as a developer, you know, if you are, um, you know, if you are in, in one of the service, building one of the microservices with uh, Python, and you are interested in moving to .NET, uh, if there is another service team which is actually building something in .NET, you can go to the .NET team and learn .NET and build .NET stuff as well. So 
within the same uh, you know organization within the within the same uh, application domain you are actually you know spending time on different programming languages so that's the fun part uh, of it by the way so i would i mean and as a developer i would love to do it because you're moving towards different different programming languages jumping on different libraries and frameworks uh, but it is very difficult to manage it yeah that sounds cool i i was as you were speaking, speaking that and i was thinking you know that sounds cool that having a different programming languages and things like that but uh, but it's not always easy. It's going to be really difficult as an organization to, uh, you know, manage that. But as as uh, rightly uh, said by Vivek, you know, if you're using patterns like Strangler pattern where you're modernizing your application uh, and you have some legacy systems that you need to, and you still need to continue to keep that as a legacy systems, you can write wrappers around it. And, and those are the, you know, perfect uh, examples of uh, when you can use, uh, you know, Polygat. Uh, programming uh, scenarios in microservices. So, Vivek, um, before we go further, I have one question from the audience, Ashutosh Khanna on YouTube asking, what points to consider whether microservice approach will fit in that project or not, or microservices architecture, is it applicable everywhere? Uh, do you want to take that one? Yeah, so if it's very simple, if you, it is a standalone project or it's, it's a project where you don't have to, you don't have any upgrade or anything, uh, then it is not a candidate for microservice. Uh, but if it, if it is a service, that means you're going to up, update it. Say, for example, the, the inventory service, the order management service, the uh, you know review service, where you have code changes going on uh, very frequently, uh, then uh, you have a couple of uh, services like that within your application. Uh, th that's the good candidate for microservice. I mean, that's, that's yeah. The also, I want to bring up one thing is like, you know, it's not uh, answering your second part of the question, which is like, is microservices architecture applicable everywhere? And the answer is no. Um, microservices are, you know, even though it gives this much benefits and advantages that we listed out here, it definitely comes with a complexity and it also um, has a cultural change in the organization. You have to start thinking every single service as an app of its own. So that's why uh, it's not always recommended to start with microservice for every single thing. Um, the monolithic uh, applications are still great. They're just a choice between, uh, they're not old or legacy uh, by, by any means. Uh, I, I know when we speak to customers, they feel that monolithic is kind of old. It's not like that. Uh, you can always use technologies, cloud native technologies like Docker's and, and Kubernetes for even monolithic application. It's just that the architectural design patterns are two different things and it gives you those benefits. So if you're large organizations looking to you know, spin up features and products, and if you are in a position to maintain that kind of an um, uh, you know, ecosystem in your organization, then I think microservices is great. It brings in great benefits, uh, but otherwise, uh, yeah, be careful in when you choose uh, a particular architecture. It shouldn't be something which you went for something and uh, you landed up, uh, you know, burning your fingers. So that shouldn't be the case. So you need to analyze it. So it's always case to case basis. Um, and also, there's one other question uh, uh, from Raju: uh, Does an API calls between microservice introduce tight coupling and add to latency? Um, so I'll take that take that up. Uh, yes. Um, so when you have uh, when you have direct API calls, that definitely has tight coupling. But there are situations where you probably need to, and those are the situations where you need to, uh, you know, think about how are you going to do that. Uh, you know, for example, in cloud, everything is failing all the time, right? Um, uh, so you you have to you have to bake in a resiliency in your uh, in your service to service calls and things like that. So whenever possible, um, keep it uh, you know asynchronous. That's the right approach to do it. Uh, but there are situations where you need to, uh, you know, do a synchronous call. So um, it's not like a strict pattern where you say, okay, you know, uh, this is something which you can't do it. No, uh, understand that, you know, th we do these things to get you that kind of flexibility. So if it's coming in that way of spoiling that flexibility, then I think you shouldn't be doing it. But otherwise, uh, you, you should be totally okay to do that too. All right. Um, so, um, Vivek, so why, why develop in microservice architecture today? Yeah, so you know, let, let me go back and uh, talk. You know, take the same example, right? So, which is which is also part of our learn module, which is the pizza sh shop, and I have a bunch of couple of services, catalog and inventory and order and everything. So uh, now, as a as a upgrade to your service, you want to add uh, a review service to that, right? And if it is monolithic, you know, as I told you, it's very difficult. It will fail. You have to build it as a whole application. Even your, if you want to just add review, you. Are you guys still there with us? Uh, 
Okay, it looks like we have some technical interruption uh, on OAX side. So I'll just go ahead. Um, so I was talking about why develop in microservice architecture. Uh, well, I think I think the big benefit or the big boost that we get right now going with microservices uh, architecture is that you know we are in a world of cloud where we have that uh, you know kind of like the, the ultimate power of the cloud where you can scale up and scale down a particular service and only pay for a specific uh, services when you need to. So uh, so when you have this kind of flexibility, going with this kind of architecture gives you greater benefit, especially think of scenarios where you have to uh, do a geo replication of your services. You can quickly do that because uh, you know you already separated the things uh, and then uh, 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 separating separate the concerns so you can bring up those services when you want to, right? Um, all right, let's go into the next one, which is uh, what role um, do containers play? And this is an important aspect that I need to answer this right away because I think often people confuse that you know writing um, a Docker container or um, uh, creating an image out of a, a Docker container uh, is making microservice. Absolutely not. You know, microservices is just an architecture pattern. It does not say that you know what technologies that you need to use to implement that. But definitely, the advantage you get with containers is that you know containerization is an approach where you package your application, your dependencies, your configuration all into a single deployable unit. So that way, you can make that deployable unit. Um, you know, uh, send it to production, deploy to production, deploy to testing, and then you get the same, uh, you know, uh, thing out there. So if you tested something, you know that it's going to work uh, on, a, on a different environment where you are deploying it, right? So there are different advantages for this, and that's one of the reasons why um, often people uh, talk about, uh, you know, containers alongside, uh, you know, when we speak about microservices. So the popularity of microservices and cloud in general have pushed a lot of cloud native technology tools to help uh, you be successful with it. So that's why uh, if you're in 2022 now, uh, when you're starting with uh, cloud native apps or microservices, uh, it's always great to uh, go with, uh, uh, you know, Dockers and uh, Kubernetes. All right, uh, so what exactly is a, Docker, um, then um, <clears throat> so Docker. I think we 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 talk about containerization and containerization is a technology um, that has been there for over a decade now. But I think uh, uh, from the point of Docker, uh, it popularized it. All right, Vivek, welcome back. Yeah, there's some um, power issue. I don't know why. <laughs> okay, you sound fine now. So you want to talk about Docker? Yeah, so yeah, so Docker is an open source uh, containerization platform, and uh, you know it's it's basically an amazing uh, platform. Uh, I mean, obviously, container was there uh, from a quite a bit of time, right? And Docker popularized the container uh, technology, and um, and and uh, it, it it's basically a, an amazing platform to uh, build and uh, and. Uh, uh, Package your uh, and package your applications into images and run it as a containers. And uh, how do you connect between uh, two containers from a network perspective and also the volume, uh, basically uh, from uh, from a storage perspective? So it provides you an amazing platform and it's CLI powerful powerful CLI where you can go ahead and execute uh, all these set of uh, commands and manage your uh, build and manage your applications. Yeah, so, uh, you know, one of the things we were having a nice chat with also Lauren, uh, uh, who's a producer of the show, that, you know, this is a good example of resiliency, like microservice resilience. So when Vivek services went down, we continue to operate uh, without really breaking up the entire stream. So that's the advantages that you get when you are in a complete asynchronous uh, side of things. Anyways, uh, jokes apart. So let's go into what exactly uh, is an, um, you know, image. We, we talk about image a lot. Um, so, uh, you know, as I mentioned previously, um, image a container image is nothing but the way you you package your application, uh, uh, your your configurations, your dependencies, including the operating system dependencies. They're all packaged into a single deployable unit, and then you finally deploy that to uh, a particular server or in your production environment or your dev environment. Doesn't matter. And then when this image is running, they're called containers. So in the other words, containers are nothing but a uh, a running instance of an image. So image, think of image as like, like something like a zipped unit, which is immutable in nature. Uh, you cannot modify that image. You can only re recreate that image, uh, provide a different version or create the tags for it. 
but you cannot uh, you know, tamper with that existing image. And that's the guarantee that you get when you test something in your dev environment, your QA environment, and in production environment, you get the same code running everywhere, including the dependencies that it requires. So that way, uh, you can find it um, uh, like helpful in terms of uh, having application run everywhere as expected. Right. Um, so quickly uh, talking about the uh, you know how does the architecture fit in right. So just just a brief of it. You know you have the container registry. That's where you store the images because somewhere you need to store so that the cloud environment can pull it. Uh, so you have the Docker Hub or ACR as your container registry. So you have the Docker client which creates a Docker pull command and you pull it from the registry and you pull the image into the Docker host or anywhere where the container images can run, including Kubernetes. And then when it is run, they have become containers. And when you want to scale, you basically scale these containers. And these environments will automatically create those virtual networks for you, as well as load balancers for you. So that way, if even if you're scaled up, it knows which service is operating at certain uh, traffic and it'll direct traffic to those things. So these, these cloud native technologies definitely help us boost uh, you know, our application development uh, in, a, in a very nice fashion. So more so just about to, that. Just to, mm -hmm. just to add there, so the images which you create uh, is also stored on the registry. So you know, right. uh, there could be your private registries, it could be your, you know, registries and like the public registries, which is Docker Hub. Um, and, uh, and then you can also build your own private registries as well. So. You know, yeah, that's absolutely. an interesting part of the uh, Docker uh, architecture, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, um, so let's talk. Let's talk about uh, Docker file. What exactly is that, Vivek? Then, yeah, Docker file is is a is basically um, you know a set of instructions. So basically, as you told, right, there is image. Uh, you create a static representation of your application when when you build. The Docker, right? When you build the image, when you build your code, so when you create a Docker image, you're just in you know providing set of instructions uh, for your for the uh, Docker engine that you know this is what the instruction is, and this instruction you execute and create an image for me, create a static representation of my app. So you know. Uh, it's a it's a uh, it's a, a very easy to build this uh, Docker file, and you can see most of the commands has been covered in uh, this specific Docker file as well as an example. And usually, this is written in a, a simple, minimal uh, language, right? Um, and uh, and basically, it starts with a base image. And if you see the from uh, command, it starts with a simple base image. And if you notice the uh, microsoft.com.net uh, SDK, which is there as the first instruction. Um, it's a package. It's already a pre-built package, which is available on the public registry, which is the repository for having uh, images, which is publicly available for you. And uh, you just have to pick that uh, image from the public registry and use it in your Docker file. And this particular Docker file is uh, starting with the Microsoft SDK, the .NET 6 SDK. And uh, you can see there are a couple of uh, other instructions like creating a working directory and you're copying the uh, and, uh, executable, the, the, pro and, uh, the project, CS project, which is, which is the code base. And then you're restoring it, uh, restoring the dependencies of this project and then uh, copying the whole uh, set of uh, other required files into this directory from the local uh, local system into the container, and then you're publishing the app uh, using the .NET publish command. And the second part of the uh, second part of this Docker file is uh, quite different, right? It's basically uh, it is having um, you know it is al already using the runtime of ASP.NET and uh, it uses the build which we did and then it just runs the framework. So this is net net, you know, try to understand this is just the uh, set of instructions which is available for you. And you, you build this, uh, you use this set of instructions uh, appropriately and create a uh, image, a uh, static representation of your application. And this is still static, so it is not running. So this is still an uh, you know, image. And uh, when you use with uh, Docker run, container run, you know, Docker run command and container runs, and that's when you call it as a container. When something is running, it's called as container. And when is it static, it is called an image. So 
Docker file is used for just creating those images. Right. So we'll talk about this because we have a hands-on uh, uh, hands-on uh, lab on this as well. So we will go through that. Um, let's talk about why build microservices in .NET. Uh, well, if you have noticed the uh, the previous few releases of .NET, uh, the performance has been improved a lot, and uh, specifically with .NET Core. Uh, was completely reimagined for the cloud environment. So faster performing uh, SDKs when you use it under the hood, you you better uh, uh, you you get better at saving the cost uh, on the on the uh, while running these applications, right? Uh, and so definitely, if you are new to this, uh, take a look at uh, .NET for your microservices development. All right. So with that, let's let's get uh, testing the knowledge so far. Whatever we have spoken, so. Um, Answer your questions. Uh, you know you can. Uh, so this is the question: Which of the following scenarios would be a candidate to become a microservice? So uh, what you can do is you can chat with us. Type in A, B, C, or D. Um, so we will go through this one by one. Uh, so that will give you some time for you to you know look at it and then uh, give us uh, your answers too. Okay, Vivek. So let's let's look at this. So uh, the question is: Which of the following scenarios would be a candidate? to become a microservice. Um, there is a Docker image, then there's GitHub Actions used to deploy a website, and there's a web API. If you're new to web API, that's nothing but uh, you know a project type in ASP.NET which gives you uh, REST endpoints. Uh, so a web API and a website that return and display a list of pizzas, uh, or A, a web API that uh, returns a list of Pizzas. So let me let me let me take a dig into this. Okay. <laughs> so it's definitely not a Docker image, you know, because mm -hmm. you can still have, um, you know, a monolithic application in it as a part of the Docker image. And GitHub yeah. Actions is more used for deploying an application. So not a building, and it's not an architecture pattern. And Web API and website that returns. It's just a statement. You know, it, it cannot have a website returning. It can only return something, which is an information. So you can't have a you know a website returning. So you know, go ahead and go for A, man. It's it's basically you know it's an API. It can only return a specific thing. So basically, you're looking at pizza, and you are just returning list of pizzas which is available through this API. Right, so so I I, I get uh, feedback from my producer saying, uh, so far we have a split on A, B, and C, and nobody selected D. That's a good thing. Uh, and A and B, I think there's a kind of confusion there, which is understandable and just a nice play of words there. Uh, so the correct answer is A, uh, which is uh, a web API that returns a list of pages. Uh, the reason for that is when you say a microservice, you're looking at just a single thing that is doing one. Um, uh, uh, like one business um, uh, domain and, and and particular actions within that business domain. So we're not trying to club these things together. So that's the reason why uh, uh, the answer A is the right one. All right, great going. Thank you for sending in this, uh, uh, and, this option. And by the way, well. whoever got A, you can just go and buy some pizzas for yourself. <laughs> All right, so and um, let's go quickly on this one too. What purpose does a Docker image have in a microservice architecture pattern? Um, a text file with instructions on how to build a microservice. Uh, a Docker image is a static representation of a microservice, its configuration, and its dependencies. Uh, Docker images allow hosts to perform load balancing and routing. Yep, yeah, I mean, it's definitely not a Docker image, which is on the load balancing and routing. And uh, and as I told you uh, while talking about the Docker file, uh, Docker, Docker file is more about uh, text file and instructions, right? And the B is the right answer because Docker image is a static representation of the microservices. So basically you're looking at that as an answer. Absolutely right. <laughs> That's great. All right. So uh, thank you again uh, for everyone who answered it. Uh, so don't forget to go check these out later. So we're going to skip the next question and we'll go straight into uh, some exercises. So uh, you see how we're going to build a Docker file uh, for our microservice. Right. So there are answers. Yep. Um, uh, that you can, uh, there are these questions can be taken up later also so that you can earn your points for that. Uh, so don't forget to do that. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and build a Docker file for my microservice. Um, so here is the uh, unit three. This is where the exercise starts. Uh, so the first instruction here is to go ahead and clone the code 
So I'm just going to copy this code. So make sure you have Git installed on your system. And I'll just paste it here. And it's going to take a few seconds. And it's going to bring in uh, the code. I'm going to go into that. And then to just make it easier, I'm going to open this in VS Code. There you go. So I have, uh, so this is a pizza app. It has a backend, it has a frontend. Frontend is nothing but a simple UI that's going to connect to the backend. So uh, this is uh, typically not exactly a microservices scenario as a whole. It's just two projects and we are trying to uh, help you understand how uh, you can start creating Dockerfile and using containers, how you can communicate with, uh, with uh, each other services, right? So uh, let's go back and see what is the instructions that I have here. Um, so what I need to do is I need to create a Docker file. So if I go to backend and uh, if I go into the Docker file, so there is an empty file, right? So uh, just to keep this thing, um, you know, uh, so that everyone's on the same page, let me just run this for now. I'll just use .NET run. Oops, um, I need to go to the backend folder and then use .NET run. So uh, don't worry about these things because I'm just only uh, executing just instructions on running it. So now if I click on this URL, it's basically an empty URL. I'm going to go to the Swagger endpoint. By default, it comes with that. Right. So now if you see, if you just click on Get, click on Try it out, execute, it basically nothing but uh, some JSON data that's coming in. Right. So this is the controller, Pizza Info controller. Uh, you can use minimal API uh, if you want to, uh, but we just, uh, I mean, we, we were doing this from .NET 5, so we just kept it that way because even in .NET 6, you can continue to use, uh, you know, API controllers uh, for your uh, app. So here it goes. So it's just an info control controller. There's static data. Uh, it is being, um, you know, rendered back when you make a get call, right? Just a simple one. Now, what we need to do is we need to containerize this application. To containerize this application, what we need to do is you have to add the Docker file. So here is the instruction that uh, Vivek actually mentioned. So I'm going to copy and paste that thing. And um, so this thing, if you look at what it is doing, is it is going going ahead and uh, it is uh, basing it out of SDK because right now, as I mentioned, when you create an image, uh, your image should have the dependencies, including the operating system dependencies. Since you're working on a .NET code, the .NET code requires, um, uh, you know, where are you running it? So in, in our case, since we are basing this out of the .NET SDK 6.0, by default, it's going to give you uh, the Linux version of it. Um, and... Um, uh, you're going to have those uh, SDKs uh, included in your image, right? So all these things are going to be taken care of for you. So it's basically going and doing a .NET restore and uh, creating a publish command so that it will just package uh, into something which you can run, right? And uh, you also have to go and copy the most other things as well. Um, so this is called a multi-stage Docker file. Uh, what that means is uh, in a Docker scenario, you can continue to build the images and each instruction that you see here uh, is, uh, is creates a layer of its own, right? So when you create layers, uh, each of it, so you can go ahead and make changes to independent layers and things like that. So with multi-stage, what we're doing right now is even though we're using this SDK to build, so we're gonna copy the code from our local, put it into the Linux environment, compile the code there, but we're not going to go into use any of the source code that we already pulled in into the work, uh, work DIR SRC folder, because we're going to ignore that and we're going to make a fresh build, which will actually say, okay, now copy everything what was built uh, using, uh, which is available in the app folder, take that in and then build my base image because while running it, you only need um, this to run. So if you look at this, the advantage of multi-stage Docker file is that you can have those test environments, you can do QA, you can ev do everything. And in the final from instruction, what you provide is what the base image is gonna be. Sorry, what the, what the final image is gonna be. So that way you can completely do the QAs and everything um, uh, going great with that, right? Okay, so that is fantastic. So now I have created the Docker file. Now the Docker needs to know where is my instruction to build the image. So I'll go ahead and, uh, and copy this code, which is Docker build hyphen T pizza backend, and I will build that. So this time I'll just open again my PowerShell and uh, I'll just copy that command. I'm just using a Docker build instead of, um, oh yeah, it says no Docker file. That is because uh, I need to see where I am right now. Uh, okay, Stage. let's go ahead and use this. Uh, backend, 
I need to go into the backend folder and then copy this thing because that's where our Docker file is. And that's why, because we give this uh, context as dot. So it's going to look at this Docker file. And if you look at this one, so it's each instruction, it is going to pick it up and, and create those layers for you. And then you can see that, you know, everything is uh, being built and that's it. Now, if I just go ahead and do Docker images command, uh, <laughs> I have too many images in my system, but at some point you will see that, you know, there was a pizza backend that was built uh let's go up let's go up let's go up. yeah there you go so there you go so it's there's a pizza backend that i just built seven seconds ago uh and you have those details right so that means now the image is being built now we can run it we remember we have the instructions also how to run this application so we can do the run command here so i'm just going to copy this paste it here and this is nothing but uh it's saying docker run in the interactive mode, remove the containers when it is done. And uh, I want to expose 5,200, that's the port of the host machine because now I'm running in my dev environment. But the internal port of that, um, uh, of the Docker container is 80. Remember when we, we also wrote an instruction called expose 80. So that's what you see here. And then we provide the name of the container and the name of the image. So now it's running on 5200. So I can open a browser, uh, go to localhost 5200. And then use swagger command and you can see that you know this is now running uh, inside of the docker um docker containers so which is very easy right i mean just write some instructions actually we can make it even more easy if you if you have vs code installed you can do Control shift p and make sure that you have docker extension installed and then you can do add docker files to workspace and you can choose the environment and then you can choose the project and this will automatically create this thing for you as well. And same tooling support in Visual Studio as well. So it's really easy uh, if you are containerizing your .NET application because you have some great tooling support. All right, let me just go back to the instructions and see if there's anything else. Uh, so I think we are good for now. Let's quickly get back to our slides and uh, talk about... Um, so let's go back. And talk about microservice orchestration. I think we need to uh, slightly go a little faster on this now so that we have more time for building the code as well. Yeah, so um, so it's it's you know you need an orchestrator, right? So Nish, so basically um, if you have 10 containers and um, I don't know which container needs to talk to which container and how do how do different containers share their storage so you need you need to have uh, some kind of orchestrator and also how do you bring up all these services together right and now it's it's not, it's like if you have 10 15 services uh, how do you you know build and deploy it and also make sure they are orchestrated they're talking to each other and uh, you know how how does it works from a network perspective so if you want to build all those things you need a simple orchestrator uh, to start with, you know, um, and we are going to talk about uh, a very amazing orchestrator in the next set of module. And but you need a simple orchestrator here for sure, and that is the Docker Composer. So Nish, uh, you know, can you go through the Docker Composer file yeah, as well? Bef before I go to that, I think um, I think the important aspect to know here is when it comes to orchestrator. Um, so once you create these container images, uh, you will be deploying this to some sort of a, a cluster where all, most of the services are going to be running uh, across maybe a single VM or maybe multiple VMs. So you need an orchestrator to kind of like manage all those things for you. And that's the infrastructure side of things. So from a DevProf point of, uh, point of view, it's all about just packaging your images and telling the image what packages you need, what dependencies you need, what are the things that you need to run it. That's all the instructions you do. But uh, finally, when you get deployed, you you need an orchestrator to take care of a few things for you, which we will go into the details of it a little later. But for this module, what we did is because there will be multiple services that you will be working uh, with locally, uh, and 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 using a very complex orchestrator may be too much of an overkill. You can continue to use Docker and then use a tool called Docker Compose to run all the uh, images and services 
together. And that is uh, that is what Docker Compose tool does. So it's technically not an orchestrator. It's just a tool to help you, uh, you know, create a network for you, create multiple. So you saw that, you know, I just built the pizza backend. We're going to go and build the pizza frontend too. So now the pizza frontend and backend have to work with each other. That means they need to know where they are running, which is a network. How are they going to send the configuration values to each other? So we use a Docker Compose tool just for this module. But in the later module, uh, we will go into a little more um, uh, you know, production-like scenario kind of uh, orchestrator, which is the Kubernetes. Um, quick thing on the uh, Docker Compose file. So let's let's go ahead and um, uh, uh, and and talk about the Docker Compose file here. And uh, in case of Docker Compose file, uh, it's nothing but again, it's a set of instructions for Docker Compose tool to understand what are, what are you trying to do here, right? So the Docker file is just a series of instructions. It's like a commands that you write. But the Docker Compose file is a YAML file. So it's, it has extension.yml uh, where you will write in those uh, things. You basically define it. OK, what is your service? So in this case, you have a service front end, you have a back end, and then you type in, OK, what does this service front end do? Like, what, what, what image does it have? And you specify that image that it needs to pull. Uh, and then it has a few things like port. Remember, we when we are running the command like docker run, and we said 5200 colon 80, 5200 was the uh, you know, host port and the AT was the internal port. In this case, you are specifying that in a single file so that you can simply go ahead and type Docker Compose and up, uh, it will bring up uh, the entire thing up, right? So let's go ahead and look at um, how do we, um, you know, take multiple services and run. But um, before that, I think we have a que we have a time for uh, one question. What do you say, Vivek? What yeah, is so good. What is one use case for an orchestrator? So is it to scale out and manage complex distributed systems of microservices? Is it to hold the Docker images in source control? Is it to automate security penetration testing? That's an interesting one. Um, so which one do you think? Um, <laughs> It's definitely not the penetration testing, and uh, orchestrators are more about building, you know, managing the complex distributed systems, uh, for sure. So it will be the right answer. The B one, you know, Docker image and source control. You know, yes, we are going to have uh, Docker images, but I don't know about having it in source control. But you can have Docker images in the repositories like Docker Hub. So that's that's something which we can have. But A is the right answer. Fantastic, and and those of you responded to us with A, congratulations, that is the right answer. And uh, um, let's go quickly on the on another question, which is also an interesting one. Which language is a, a Docker Compose file written in? Is it C sharp? I think so. No, it no. may be YAML. <laughs> it may be JSON. It's 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 in it's it's in the background. YAML is the new code. <laughs> it's in my background. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. The the new language of the cloud, huh? Um, all right, people. Uh, YAML is the right answer too. All right, so one more exercise left in this module. So I'll go quickly do that. Is about creating the Docker Compose file. Again, you can see how easy these modules are to execute. Um, as long as you install Docker uh, correctly, um, you should be able to execute most of the things that are written here. All right, so let's go to the unit file, which has this Docker Compose file. All that I need to do is go here, copy this Docker Compose uh, file, and then go into the Docker Compose YML file. Again, that's an empty file. Just go ahead and Control V. That will save uh, the file. Okay. Now, when I'm going to run this, it is going to run two things. One is the pizza backend, and it is also going to run the pizza frontend because, as you saw, we have a backend and we have a frontend. So the front end already has a Docker file. You can see that there is a Docker file, how this has to be uh, built. There is instruction here, so which is good. So it is only going to look at which is a Docker file, um, which is available for these projects. And then it is going to build that file if that image is not available. Right. So in your system, so in my case, Pizza front end is already available, so it's already built, so it shouldn't much take much time. Uh, but if it is not built, uh, it is going to go and build that image for you. Now, while running, these, these instructions come in handy, which are the ports. And um, so this is where the external port uh, is, uh, the host port is exposed. So for example, backend will run on finance 02 and the front end will run on finance 00. Uh, same thing as when you type doc or run uh, and, and then provide the port with the hyphen P. It's the same thing that you write it here in the YAML file. 
The interesting thing I wanted to show you here is that you know the, now the front end has to connect with the back end. So front end is nothing but a simple UI, and that UI has to connect with the back end. That is the JSON data that you saw that is going to be displayed in a UI. Now that data has to come from somewhere, and that's your back end. So your front end needs to know where exactly is your back end, and that is what uh, you will be providing uh, an environment variable uh, in your um, you know. In your in your front end service, saying what is your back end URL. So what you're doing here, you're actually giving the name of the service that you defined here back end. So when you send this thing into uh, into the environment variable, what it's going to do is it is going to inject into the environment side of your application. So when you go into my um, into let's see if it's the I think it's the startup.cs when we create the HTTP client. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, so you, here you go. So it's creating this HTTP client, which is a Pisa client. And here it says we say configuration.get value back in the URL. So now the ASP.NET Core uh, has this built-in configuration, um, uh, you know, helper methods, which will actually pull that value uh, from the environment variable. That's it. And your .NET application doesn't even know where, uh, whether you're running it in a Docker container or outside. All that it is, it was, it is looking for is the back in URL um, that that uh, value, right? Uh, so that value is actually injected, and that is what we do in the Docker Compose file. So now to run this, I need to be in the root folder. Um, so let me go to MS Learn. Yeah, and then instead of using a Docker uh, command, I will be using Docker Compose and up. See, there is no more instructions. Like we are not uh, providing any more instructions. So it's what it's doing is it's going and running uh, both the uh, both the uh, images. So for example, let's say if I do a Docker ps command and you'll see that you know there are p the front end p the back end both of them are running now and uh, it's running on finance 00 and finance 02 back front end is running on finance 02 so we can now go uh, open a browser and go to find 902 and you can see that uh, there is that web page uh, internally, it's the Razor pages, which is actually querying the Pisa client uh, and then getting that response. So whatever you saw as a JSON value now has a, a UI to it. Very simple application, but uh, it just uh, it just clears out two things. How do you build your Docker image and how do you communicate with other services? So um, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's about it for uh, this uh, module and um, some great references out there for you. So make sure you check that out. And uh, what we did here is just a, a summary of uh, what uh, what we did here is the explain what microservices are in general. Uh, we talked about cloud native technologies like Docker, uh, and we also built a microservices endpoint uh, in .NET. So, all right. So let's Vivek, go to the, I, yeah, let's go to the next module. My like, favorite yes, module. Yeah, I know you, you are an expert on Kubernetes. So let's go to the next step, right? So now we have to think about deploying your application uh, or your .NET application uh, into more production-like scenario, like probably Kubernetes, right? Um, so so what, are the, what are the learning objectives, Vivek? So uh, in this module, uh, we're going to cover a couple of things. One, we will try and understand the briefly understand the uh, complex orchestrator. You know, the previous one was a simple orchestrator, but now we're going deep diving into the complex orchestrator, and then uh, we will build the .NET app and uh, deploy it uh, and push it to the uh, Docker Hub, which is uh, which is a registry, and then we're going to. Uh, spend some time in terms of deploying this application on Kubernetes, and also we will see a couple of Kubernetes um, important things like the scale and uh, and our resilience and other things, right? And this is the, about the module. And let's go. Cool. To the next slide. So cool. So and you so go ahead, Nish. No, no, I was about to ask you about. Uh, so now we are talking about the real orchestrator in in, in picture. <laughs> yeah, what exactly is an orchestrator and why we need them? And um, yeah, let's let's talk about that. Yeah. So basically, you know, there are two things. So so basically, um, you have a couple of containers, right? So you know, the pizza shop example, which uh, Nish showed, we have 
couple of containers there and you want to dynamically increase this number of containers which is running uh, just to make sure that your application is scalable and uh, that is one part of it and then there is uh, automatic updates you know basically you are updating different containers you have 10 different containers and you are uh, you know versioning different containers you are releasing code and how do you do it how do you manage it that's where container orchestration comes comes into play and uh, that's the main uh, goal of using orchestrators but it also has different set of things like the network and uh, storage and other things as well so we'll go ahead and uh, just introduce uh, you know to the content management which is also the same thing which i just discussed it is basically about uh, how do you organize it how do you add it how do you remove it and how do you bring up a new set of things as well right so you know just to introduce you to the Kubernetes, you know, it's very a little bit of complex if it is for the first time, if you're seeing this architecture. So Kubernetes is an amazing platform. It's a container orchestrator platform, and it is also, uh, and it also abstracts uh, your infrastructure as well. So that's something which it does. And uh, basically it's a declarative uh, tool. So when I say declarative, there are different set of tools. One is imperative and the other is declarative. So when I say imperative, imperative means you are uh, giving set of instructions, specific instructions, what needs to be done. Okay, looks like we are in the same situation again. We lost him, <laughs> all right. Let's let's talk about Kubernetes until um, Vivek comes back. Um, so Kubernetes is an orchestrator platform, and uh, it is one of the most popular ones. There are obviously uh, many others out there, and uh, we are talking about the Kubernetes architecture. So Kubernetes has this uh, API server where you you say what is your desired state, and uh, that is written as a uh, declarative configuration. So in your configuration, you can say this is my container, and I want to have five of these containers running, or this is my image for the container, I want five of them. And Kubernetes will look at that, and it will look at the actual state, and it'll look at the desired state, and it'll make sure the actual state and the desired state are equal. That means any point of time, if your application clashes, um, uh, you know, if your application clash, cl clashes, then you can actually bring it back in um, by Kubernetes looking at the state itself. And that is very amazing. Uh, you know, every time I see that happen, it is really, really cool. Um, all right, so how does this do? Uh, so always uh, Kubernetes has this master node and also the other nodes are called the worker nodes. Um, and all the worker nodes have this kubelet in it. And kubelet is that uh, simple uh, you know, tool that it queries to understand what is the state uh, of services running on the uh, worker node. So master nodes are uh, the one where Kubernetes actually runs its IP API server. And it has obviously has those control managers, which looks at, um, you know, what parts to run, what is the replications uh, set that you defined, how many, um, uh, you know, services need to be run. So all those things are taken care of by the control manager, looking at it and bringing it up. And there's scheduler, and there's also this etcd database, and that's the uh, that's the uh, you know heart of this uh, entire Kubernetes architecture, where uh, it it where all whatever configuration you set that this is the scale you need, this is the number of parts you need, those are all set um, in the etcd. So that's what uh, it looks at and then maps it. Okay, and um, it also gives you a lot of uh, virtual net uh, like. It gives you a virtual network, so it doesn't matter whether your service is running on a VM1, VM2, or VM100. It doesn't matter. Uh, it can run on anywhere, and um, uh, and this whole thing is managed automatically uh, by the uh, Kubernetes uh, in a master node. Welcome back. We're back again. <laughs> yeah, I don't know something wrong today with my power. Um, no issues. No, let's go back. To the session. Yeah, so I, I kind of like explain the uh, Kubernetes architecture. So you may, if you have anything else to add on to this, uh, we can talk about that, or we can. Oh, nothing. Uh, just the uh, just a basic unit of Kubernetes. It's pod and uh, and right pods. Yes. And a single, so, uh, any containers uh, you're running, it's either it is single container or multiple containers. It's called pods, and you can see it is run on the worker node here. Yeah. So it's available on the worker nodes. So yeah, let's go back thing. and let, let's go into the demo then. Yeah, yeah. One oh, thing yeah, I want to add on that. Yeah, yeah. I just want to add on to uh, one thing. There is um, the the the. It's always confusing if you're a newcomer to understand what 
we talk about containers and we talk about pods, and then you probably will learn a few things more like services and and deployments and and different kinds of uh, you know configuration that you will define. Uh, well, to understand pods, pods is nothing but a simple abstraction over containers. So containers are just what uh, your Docker Docker host can run it, um, uh, but pod is another abstraction layer on top of it, to which actually uh, gives that one-on-one -on -one mapping, uh, but also sometimes you can have multiple containers running in a single pod. And that's where uh, something like a sidecar approach and things like that come into play. Yep. We will look at that in, in probably a later session, it's slightly more advanced uh, than the basic one, right? Uh, so just understand pods is just an abstraction layer on top of uh, containers, which, which yeah. is just a Kubernetes so it's, 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 it's basically, uh, since we are talking about containers, you have single containers or multiple containers, it is abstracted to as called as pods. Right. Cool. All right. Yes. Let's talk about some of the benefits of uh, Kubernetes. Um, see, one of the one of the thing that um, I like about this is the self healing technique that I was talking about earlier, uh, which is about the actual state versus the desired state. Because Kubernetes has this, uh, you know, frequent check on whether the whether, whether the actual state and the desired state is equal. Any kind of crashes and things like that. Kubernetes will try and recover things for you. So you don't have to manually intervene and look at what happened. If a service is, if there were supposed to be five replicas of your service and one is down, it'll bring back the fifth one. As long as there is no issue with the Kubernetes master node, uh, it is gonna bring that thing back, right? So, so that's kind of like a very interesting uh, feature of Kubernetes. Um, and the other one is the dynamic scaling, right, Vivek? Yes. So. You know, interesting, right? Um, when you are scaling your pods in, in a Kubernetes world, it's nothing but, you know, container scaling, but it's, it, we call it all these pods. And uh, whenever uh, you're scaling your applications, uh, whenever you have a lot of uh, requests to your applications, you have to scale that specific uh, service. And uh, that scale part of it and dynamically scaling it and bringing it down. I say, for example, uh, you might say, I need a maximum of 10 uh, pods running and uh, minimum of five running and uh, m you know when there is a request coming in uh, the number of pod goes up to the 10 and uh, when the request is uh, request is less um, you know the number of pods running will be back to five and we will see that in an example as well in how exactly you can set that uh, set those uh, settings as well Right, right, and um, and a few things like rolling updates, managing storage. Uh, uh, it manages the network traffic, as I mentioned. It creates a virtual network, uh, so in internal services can access, uh, regardless of where your service is running and whichever virtual machine it's running. It always has that virtual network, uh, so you can access them uh, through a simple DNS query. Right. Um, all right. Um, so with that, let's go to a quick set of questions again. Um, so the question is. Why is a container orchestrator useful in a microservice architecture? Um, all right, people, send in your answers. Uh, is it A, B, or C? Is each microservice needs to be maintained, scaled, and deployed individually, and orchestrator helps manage those tasks. Um, an orchestrator holds instructions on how to build and version Docker image. Um, and C, an orchestrator is the only means by which to run a containerized application uh, in the cloud. So which of it is true? Let, let me, let, is it A? Yeah, it's, it should be A. It should Isn't be it? A. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so an orchestrator is the only means by which to run a container application in the cloud is absolutely no. You can, you can run it without an orchestrator. There are a number of cloud uh, vendors providing you different ways to do it. Um, an orchestrator holds instructions on how to build. Obviously not. The orchestrator doesn't know anything about how you build your image. So obviously it's going to be the A. And thank you so much for sending in all your answers. And everyone has said A. So that is amazing. All right. So that is the right answer. And uh, Vivek, let's go ahead, share your screen. And uh, we will talk about uh, you know, deploying the Kubernetes, uh, de deploying the Docker application to Kubernetes. Yeah, and and this is the learn module uh, which uh, I'm going to use in this, uh, you know, in this example as well. And you know, there are a couple of settings you need to have a Docker desktop here installed. And you see here, you have you should have a, a Docker Hub account. 
And we are taking the same example, the pizza shop, which Nish was using. And uh, the repository is here. And I've just cloned the repository uh, just in case you know, you know we run out of time, right? We have just cloned it. So you can just copy this instruction and clone your repository and the code will be downloaded. And then um, we did this already, right? Um, Nish did build and uh, bring bring up the uh, composer and you know, the the Docker compose file. So basically, he's bringing up the uh, complete application. So let's build it. So I have already done the build. So once you do the build, uh, it's here. The you know basically the image is being created. So I've just used the same command. So just Two minutes back, I've run the same command. So let us bring this up in, in the background mode though. So I'm just bringing it up just to show you what it does. So I have this in in the, you know, in the Docker uh, Compose, right? So it's just running a simple service which we have already executed before. I haven't done anything related to Kubernetes yet. So this is the application which uh, Nish had brought it up, right? Now, what we have to do is, so we have to go back to the, so we need to sign into our Docker Hub account, right? So this is the Docker Hub. Yeah, so while you do that, I, I'll just quickly explain, um, you know, Docker Hub is nothing but a container registry. So once you create the image, um, your Kubernetes environment or uh, wherever you are pulling in your image should know where to pull this information, pull the image from. And we're using the Docker Hub. You can use any uh, container registry uh, for that matter. And uh, Docker Hub uh, is free for your learning and uh, uh, development and things like that. So uh, so yeah, it just makes it easy for you to get started because you already have the Docker tool yeah. installed, so it's easier to do that as well. So this, this, this is a public repository as well. So, so anything you get started with, um, if you just type in anything and if you don't have the image within your local system, uh, you know, the Docker command searches in the Docker Hub first. And that's that's the main purpose of it. And this is these are all my um, you know my uh, images. Uh, I've created these images quite a long back. And this is the repository, right? So now I have an account. I have everything ready, and I need to do a tagging. So what what is tag is basically what you're doing is um, you're uh, tagging the already built image uh, to reference it to the Docker Hub, right? So, so the, here, uh, the image which we had built, so for example, this one, these two image, it's local as of now. I wanna make sure this two image is tagged to the Docker Hub. So we're gonna go back and uh, tag that up. So let's go and execute this command here. And the... Docker name, right? I've done that now and I've tagged it. I can go and tag the other one as well. So I just putting my um, ID, you see, your Docker username. So let's put that username. That's my username there. Bring it, and then you have to just push this uh, image, the tagged image, to the Docker Hub. So it's pretty easy and it's very straightforward. We'll go here and just push it. So doc, Docker push and image name. So let's take that. Okay, let's first run the tag. Right, so let's see the tags which has been created. So you can see here, the tag has been created. There were two, there are four now. And we will go back here and Docker push. We will push these front end to my Docker Hub account. And then we will push the back end. 
So let's give it a minute to push it. So you're pushing the front end first, or did you push the back end too? The front end first. Okay, cool. Yeah, I wanted to. Um, so that once you push this uh, front end first, and then when you push the back end, you'll see how fast the Docker does uh, on the second one because it uses the cached layers. Uh, uh, and it's a very interesting way how it does it. Uh, so that way, uh, you know, it just makes it easy for, um, you know, even storage and things like that too. Oops. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. So let me push the other one. Back. This will be fast. Yeah. So it says preparing. Um... Okay. So this is great. So while this is going, let me go to the run module. Um, so it's basically, you know, you're, we have pushed it. Everything is up there. We'll go to the next unit and we're going to deploy, uh, the application, right? So basically if you see my Docker account now, the Docker hub account now, uh, what you will see is at least the front end will be here. If the back end is not here yet, or both of them Should are here. Be. So if yeah. both of them are here, right? So it's pretty fast. So we are here and, uh, let me go to the next exercise and let's run and deploy to the Kubernetes. So here uh, you need to make sure that your Docker desktop is set properly for usage. So how do you do that? How do you verify that? So let me go here uh, to my terminal. I have kubectl, which is the client, uh, Kubernetes client, where it is talking to the API server. So I'm going to make sure that my config is right. Get context. So if you see here, my context is set to Docker desktop. So I'm using the Docker desktop context. I have other context, which is on uh, Azure Kubernetes uh, service. But right now, I'm going to use uh, Docker desktop, right? Yeah, and you can also enable clear. Yeah, you can also enable it here uh, if you have Correct, installed. Yeah. Docker. yeah, if you have uh, Docker Desktop installed, you just go to the Kubernetes and just enable it, and it's up and running. And you could see this as well, right? In uh, some of my images here, is built. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, oh, I'm pretty fast. Fluffy fingers. <laughs> yep. So here uh, is. Uh, the images, if you see here, is, these are all Kubernetes images, right? So that's what it is. So anyways, this is done. So I have uh, Kubernetes running and everything, and uh, I just need to create uh, a set of instructions for Kubernetes to run. So I'll just open this code. Where is this code? Uh, am I in code? Yes, I'm in the code. So let me go here and open it in my VS code. And create, okay, my VS code is in the other system. Let me push this out. Let me bring it up here. Hey, let's click on the trust one. Yeah, so let me create new file and create a YAML. So this is backend YAML. I'm creating, as we told you, right? So YAML is a new code, right? So this is the uh, instructions uh, which you're providing uh, for communities to you know, take, get started. So this is having a couple of things. I'm, I'm running through a deployment kind, which is a deployment controller, and have it has three specifications, right? The API, the metadata, which you have to specify with the spec, and you can notice this, this is the replica that is only one uh, pod, which is having one container will run, and here is the container details. So you can see here the container details is my uh, Docker Hub account details, right? The Docker username, or the uh, Docker Hub account username. And here you are setting a couple of things, which is with respect to the environment. And then you're creating a service. This is a service to access uh, the um, access the deployment kind, the, the service which you're going to deploy, which is Pizza backend. And this is accessible via cluster API, which is uh, which is not part of uh, exposed, right? And we will see another service on the front end. Since this is back end, it should not be exposed. The front end should be exposed and that will be built on the load balancer. So let's go back here and update this code. 
and just you know update my id here and just save this and we are done with this and now we go back and uh, create for we did create for back end yeah, deploy yes we have to do it for the front end let's do it for the front end as well and then So front end as well is the same code, right? There is nothing much changes. Everything is the same, but the environment uh, is changing because it is referencing the is a backend uh, code, and that is what it means. In the same thing, we are doing with the deployment kind, with the PISA front end, and then there is a service kind, which is to access this particular this particular uh, pod and that is through load balancer so that is pretty simple and that is pretty straightforward so we just copy this and go back here and just convert this into quick save it uh, we have done the saving Everything is ready for us to go and execute now. So all we need to do is just apply backend and frontend. So here is a, it's a simple Kubernetes command, right? So let's go back and apply. So we have applied this, and then we go and apply uh, frontend. Frontend deploy. And we have applied, and we will see kubectl get pods. You will see the pods are running, and uh, these pods are running, uh, you know, in the local, right? So when I go to the local host, and if you see, uh, I go into the local host here. If you see here in the learn module as well, we will see the application running. So this one is running through my uh, Docker Compose app, which is on the Docker side uh, with together uh, built as a one single unit, uh, all the containers built as one single unit. And here it is running on Kubernetes, which is a complicated orchestrator with other set of things, uh, which you can enable on this, right? So now we are running this in terms of um, you know, Kubernetes, right? But we will see uh, different scenarios where uh, in the next exercise, we'll see how we can scale it, how we can you know, bring it down and other things. So we will see how you can do the replications. So now kubectl get pods, you have this many number of pods and we will deploy five replications. That means five different pods gets created for the backend service. So you can see here, it is creating five different services. I'll not wait for it to keep running. No. It will start in a few seconds. And let me see that, make sure that, you know, we can also scale it down. When there is not much traffic, you can also scale it down. So let's go back and scale it down as well. So we just need to put the replica back to one and it is scaling it down, right? So let's see. See, it is already scaled down. So that's the, you know, that's how you can scale up and scale down in Kubernetes. And you can set these up in the uh, deployment file itself. And the way, the why, the reason why we are using deployment is because we are, you know, as a whole, we are applying it to the uh, complete deployment kind. So that's the reason why we are using a deployment here. And just to prove how exactly this works in terms of uh, resilience, you know, basically if you, go and delete something and how exactly this works from a delete perspective. Uh, you delete a pod and it will get recreated. So just notice this, you know, it's it's running, you know, basically uh, if you see here, it's running from two minutes as of now. And we'll go here and oops, we'll go here and just delete it. QCDL, uh, delete pod, sorry. Let's get pod first. Pods, cube, CTL, delete, pod. Yeah, so okay. you can also notice the name. It has those um, random yeah, values there. Different names. So 
Yeah, you know, you delete the pods. I mean, he's trying to reproduce a scenario where it probably has crashed or something. Uh, yes. So what does Kubernetes do if some pod, uh, you know, has a crash, right? So in production, you will never go and delete pods like this. Uh, it's just to show you how to do So here this. you notice that I deleted this pod. That's, that means something happened on the pod and it recreated. And basically this, if you notice the name change here, so that's yeah. the difference. So that's what resilience is all about. So community is a, such an amazing orchestrator that you can scale it. And, and also if something happens, it will automatically bring, bring those changes back. So the beauty of this is uh, you have uh, provided the, um, you know, the instructions via the YAML file, which is, which is what we did here. So we did tell that we need only one replication. So we could have said we need three replications and it will make sure that those three replications is maintained. And you can also say maximum replications, like whenever there is a lot of traffic, you can have, you can scale up to 10 replications and other things. So, so these are all settings you can uh, provide in the uh, YAML file. And that's what the uh, module is also all about. So Nish, awesome. Uh, yeah. So, so we'll just bring back our screen and uh, my screen, and then we can go on the next row. So that was really, really easy. We looked at two modules. We clubbed it together because it always made sense to do it together. Uh, we created on the first, we basically went in uh, as a developer, we created a, a Docker file and then uh, containerized it. And then we, in the, the second one, we actually deployed it to Kubernetes as well. So, which is awesome. All right, so let's go into the last knowledge check, um, which is why does Kubernetes automatically restart pods that have failed? Uh, let's, uh, let's go in and uh, read out these things. Uh, A, Kubernetes will maintain the system state as defined in the configuration file, no matter what. B, Kubernetes will maintain the current system state uh, as is when a failure occurs. Uh, Kubernetes will not automatically recover, rather it needs to be told to. Um, yeah, if Kubernetes was a person, maybe the C would have been the right thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, As I told you, right, it's all about configurations. So it just makes sure whatever user has given as a configuration, so it just take that configuration and it just makes sure uh, that uh, it, it takes care of that configuration, right? So that's the good part of Kubernetes. It's a very good friend of us. You just tell it, uh, this is what we want, and it just takes takes uh, that information and just goes ahead and make sure it gives you all the help. Yeah, so always remember the desired state versus the actual state. Actual state. Uh, that's the yeah. key thing. So your desired state is what you write in your configuration. That's the declarative configuration. Uh, all right. Um, so just to summarize, what we looked at uh, right now is we learned the concepts behind orchestrators. Uh, we took an existing .NET microservice uh, hosted on a Docker container and pushed it to Docker Hub. Uh, and then we deployed the microservice to Docker Hub to a local Kubernetes instance. Now, uh, the reason uh, there are many ways you can deploy to Kubernetes if you are uh, if you're adventurous, try it out on a real cloud, uh, like Azure Kubernetes service. The YAML files are all same as long as the context is correctly written. Uh, you will be able to uh, deploy with the same YAML uh, uh, script that you wrote. Uh, but we wanted to show you uh, really easily to do it because Docker Desktop also comes with the Kubernetes, so it's easier to enable that. You can use other instances like Minikube for it as well. And uh, we also learned how to scale a container instance in Kubernetes cluster. So uh, basically, the way uh, we make sure it was writing a scale command. Uh, but um, you would probably write a scale uh, replica set in your YAML file and configure it that way. Okay, And uh, there's some great references out there. Um, please check it out. I have, um, um, I have done an entire video of this in a nutshell on what microservices are and, and then connected all of it. Uh, so don't forget to check that out too. And also we have some great eBooks and uh, reference samples that'll help you build microservices, not just the Dockers and containers, but also understanding domain-driven design and uh, you know how multiple services can work together and things like that. Some great documentation out there. Um, all right, um, so we learned uh, about uh, building your microservice with .NET and deploying .NET microservice to Kubernetes. So those are your links. Don't forget to try them out. They're really, really simple ones, uh, and then uh, earn your points. And uh, before we sign off, 
we wanted to let you know that don't miss out on some amazing sessions that are lined up for uh, you on the microservices, the microservices side of things. Every Tuesday, same time, uh, we're going to do uh, some really advanced to intermediate to advanced topics. And the next one being uh, create and deploy a cloud native ASP.NET Core microservice where we will look at uh, an entire e-commerce application. And uh, ideally, the best way to learn microservices is not about like file new project, but to understand, okay, what is the, my infrastructure right now? And uh, what is the feature that I want to develop? And is it a new microservice that I need to develop? Then you go ahead and build a new microservice add it to an existing cluster. And we will do that completely on an Azure Kubernetes service, uh, entirely on a browser. And that's the funny part, because we will not be using any, any local machine. We will execute everything uh, on an Azure CLI. And, and we'll go into much more in depth, like you know how to implement health checks and things like that in ASP.NET. All right, so don't forget to check that out. We have some great sessions lined up uh, every Tuesday, same time. See you in the next. See you.